prepared uh, for any natural disasters. Um, before we go any further, I have some thank yous to give. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Palos Verdes Peninsula High School and to Palos Verdes Unified School District. We have here our new superintendent, Dr. Devin Serrano. Welcome, Dr. Serrano. Thank you very much for, for being here on a Sunday afternoon. We also have all, this is an event that um, is a partnership of all of our four cities on the hill. And uh, this is an extension of the annual uh, Prepared Peninsula Expo program that the four cities on the hill have been conducting uh, for, I believe, eight or nine years. I know that there was a little pause during the pandemic. But I do uh, want to uh, acknowledge, let, let me just acknowledge everyone first, and then I'll be calling up individual uh, representatives of all of our, our, our four cities. But we have uh, right, here, right, right here in Rolling Hills Estates, and representing Rolling Hills Estates is our mayor, Britt Hoff. Councilwoman Pat Brown Schachter. And our city manager, Greg Gramer. Representing the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, we have Mayor Pro Tem John Cruikshank. Is uh, uh, Councilman uh, David Bradley here? I did not see him yet. We're expecting uh, David. Um, and uh, last but certainly not least, Rancho Palos Verdes City Manager, Ara Moranian. <laughs> Representing the beautiful city of Rolling Hills, we have Mayor Patrick Wilson. I should be careful. All of our four cities on the hill are beautiful, so <laughs> in case you caught that there. Uh, do we have anyone else from Rolling Hills? Seeing none. Yes, Leah, Leah Mersh, Councilwoman Leah. I don't know if you're Mayor Pro Tem or Councilwoman. Leah Mersh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we are waiting. Do we have a uh, representative from Palos Verdes Estates? We are expecting Councilman David McGowan uh, to be joining us shortly. But again, uh, thank you very much to all of our cities uh, who are uh, representing uh, their respective cities at this event. This is also a partnership of our elected officials, uh, federal, county, and state. And uh, uh, before I go any further, let me interrupt our state senator over there, Ben Allen. You, you, you want to come say a few words? Oh. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll hold off uh, calling up uh, Senator Allen. This is also uh, being co-sponsored by uh, Congressman Ted Liu and Supervisor Janice Hahn, representing Supervisor Hahn. I saw her earlier, Jennifer Lamarque. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And so this is, uh, as I've been emphasizing, a collaborative effort of all of these partners. We also have uh, ready to go, I didn't confirm this, but I believe we have a representative from uh, California Water Service, uh, Angie Gilbride. Is Angie here? Okay. And the West Basin Municipal Water District, Matt Vey. All right. So yeah, I, I know that there have been issues about, uh, about water mains, water leaks, uh, and uh, uh, how that uh, may or may not be related to land movement issues on the peninsula. Uh, and so we want to be uh, prepared for, for those type of questions. All right. Did I cover all of our acknowledgments? Yes, okay. All right, so um, I, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, acknowledge that I obviously all of you are here because you are concerned about natural disasters, uh, especially here on the peninsula. Uh, I am a fellow resident. I live in Rolling Hills Estates. And uh, I, I just saw uh, former Councilwoman Judy Mitchell. Uh, Judy, thank you for joining us also. But uh, clearly, we are seeing uh, more extreme weather, uh, according to the scientists, being caused by climate change. 
uh, and that uh, these extreme weather conditions are unfortunately uh, projected to only get worse. Uh, whether we're talking about uh, some of the extreme rains that we saw this past winter, uh, that is being um, uh, in part uh, blamed for uh, some of the land movement issues, the landslide, the horrible, horrible landslide that we saw uh, in Rolling Hills Estates, the, ho the, the 12 homes uh, that uh, had to be evacuated, you know, or whether it's some of the more recent issues. Uh, we, we know that uh, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes uh, declared a local state of emergency uh, to address the increased land movement issues uh, in the Seaview, Portuguese Bend, and Abalone Cove neighborhoods. Uh, that uh, is also uh, being attributed to uh, water issues uh, combined with the unique geology of, uh, of the area. I was learning about bentonite clay uh, from my tour with uh, uh, RPV city officials. Um, and that, of course, is on top of, you know, long, long uh, time concerns here on the Hill, issues, uh, concerns about wildfire. The entire peninsula, as we all know, uh, is designated by CAL FIRE as a very high fire risk uh, hazard zone. So we uh, all need to be prepared uh, for wildfires. We'll be, we'll be hearing from uh, our emergency uh, response, uh, our, our first responders, um, on how we can all be prepared uh, for these conditions. And last but certainly not least, you know, our old friend, uh, earthquakes in Southern California. Um, where we always uh, have to be aware of and always have to be prepared uh, for the uh, realities of the big one. So um, before, uh, let, let, let me um, invite up uh, each of our uh, representatives of our cities to say um, a few words of greeting. And let me start with the mayor of Rolling Hills Estates, uh, Mayor Brett Huff. Thank you very much. We uh, so much appreciate our Assemblyman Al Murasuchi for hosting this uh, town hall and um, uh, bringing this, uh, this major topic to the forefront. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the City of Rolling Hills Estates and we just um, love and appreciate our wonderful high school here and working with all of the school district uh, and having a kind of a, a special partnership with them. I, um, I also want to thank uh, Senator Ben Allen for his participation and uh, to both of our, our representatives for all of the support that they have given us here uh, on the peninsula, especially more recently, the wildfire cameras provided by uh, Assemblyman Murasuchi, which uh, adds a lot of, of security to our feelings as we see these kinds of major wildfires uh, erupting throughout the country. Uh, also, we're so pleased to have uh, Chief Bennett from the the Los Angeles County Fire Department and the emergency departments through the county and state and Department of Insurance participating this morning, this afternoon with us. I do want to have, uh, take the opportunity to introduce a couple of people from our city. We have our city manager, I think he's already been introduced, Greg Grammer, and our assistant city manager, Alexa Davis, and our city's emergency coordinator, Jessica Swan uh, Slauson, and staff person, Samantha Crew, who participated earlier in the preparedness uh, uh, pr presentation outside, and I hope you all had a chance to participate in that. And uh, also would like to introduce Judy Bain, uh, up there, chair of our Parks and Activities Committee. Where's, where's Judy? Thank you for being here. So I hope you all had a chance to visit the Preparedness Expo today and get the kind of inf information and resources 
that are going to be helpful for us in preparing, uh, as you will hear more of this as we go along. One of the things that our city has really been encouraging over the years is a, a grassroots organization of our neighborhoods in terms of setting up uh, HOA type of situations where you have communication among yourselves because in a major disaster, we may be momentarily or perhaps even for a longer period of time left without communication and the kind of services that we we're so used to and dependent on each other, especially our neighbors. So we encourage people to get to know their neighbors and to communicate. We have, as a city, established a regular neighbor, neighborhood watch council that meets every other month to provide communication between neighborhoods and um, we have used the role model for Rancho Palos Verdes, uh, where they have been very successful in setting up that kind of communication. And we appreciate the partnerships that we've had with the other cities here on the peninsula and our efforts to work together to make a difference. So thank you again for being here, and uh, thank you to our representatives. Thank you very much, Mayor Huff. Ne next, I'd like to invite uh, Mayor Pro Tem of Rancho Palos Verdes, John Cruikshank. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for being here today. Uh, in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, emergency preparedness is a big part of our city, as has already been mentioned. Our city actually has a seven-member emergency preparedness committee. They meet every month, and that's all they talk about is being prepared for emergencies. And all four cities work together in collaboration, and we have special tools, something called Zone Haven, that creates evacuation zones. You've probably seen the Know Your Zone signs all over the community. And uh, also, we have wildfire detection cameras that have been installed, and we appreciate the assembly member uh, providing funding for that for several years. It's actually, yep. It, it's actually a really great system, and the, the Pano AI system, and AI it is an artificial intelligence, but there are cameras that are f focused on the entire peninsula, so it's not just the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. And what it does is when it starts to see smoke, the artificial intelligence figures out if it's just some person out there barbecuing or if it's a real fire that's starting to grow. And if it's something that does appear to be a fire, then it sends that information out to the proper emergency personnel. So, and I know it's already picked up a few fires already. So we're, we're very fortunate to have that system. So thank you for that. Um, also, um, and that grant goes for 10 years. So we're gonna be protected at least for 10 years. So the better we're prepared, the better we all are. So thank you all for being here. Please visit all the booths. And um, once again, like our city manager always says, Eagle Scout motto, be prepared. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Next, we'll have the mayor of Rolling Hills, Patrick Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. Great to see so many people involved in the preparedness for natural disasters. And I'd like to think that uh, even the small city of Rolling Hills is doing its part uh, in preparing for natural disasters. For example, uh, when I went through CERT training five years ago, the biggest issue we had at the time was earthquake safety, and now it's sort of morphed into fire safety and uh, certainly land movement. And uh, on the fire safety side, our city has made major contributions, I think, to the peninsula by spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last several years to remove fire fuel from the conservancy land, which borders the southern uh, border of Rolling Hills. So we, we're doing our share. We're trying to do our share. Um, we've also uh, implemented a, a project that will uh, install sirens, and that's for, that's for emergency, emergency notification, primarily or ex actually exclusively when there's a complete loss of power within our community. So the sirens will be battery-powered, uh, solar-generating um, or uh, solar-powered um, batteries, and that will hopefully keep our 
residents uh, aware, and certainly the, the boundaries of the site will go beyond the city of Rony Hill, so that might even help out to surrounding cities. Um, as mentioned previously, we work closely with the other cities on the peninsula. I think there's a great collaboration between the different uh, city councils and the residents and the different community organizations, and we continue. We plan to continue to keep up that cooperation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Do we have a representative from Palos Verdes Estates here? Seeing none, okay. Let me uh, now give a, a very special uh, welcome to uh, uh, my partner in, in this effort, uh, State Senator Ben Allen. Uh, S Senator Allen and I, just uh, before he, he comes up, uh, we recently took a tour of, uh, of the uh, Seaview uh, neighborhood situation, the Klondike Can Canyon land movement situation, and of course we also got briefed on what's happening in Portuguese Bend and Abalone Cove. But, uh, you know, I, I, I want to uh, make sure that uh, you all know that Senator Allen and I work closely together and, and we're, we're going to definitely going to be uh, uh, looking into how we can support some of the, the hydraulic, uh, the, um, the, the auger system that the uh, city of Rancho Palos Verdes is, is proposing uh, so that we can address uh, some of these concerns about the land movement. But uh, uh, I'd like to welcome State Senator Ben Allen. Appreciate you, Al. Thank you very much, everybody. I just wanted to, to come here to be a part of this. I mean, this is a, uh, a subject that we know is near and dear to everyone's hearts. Uh, the world continues to change, climate change challenges. We've always had uh, challenges here on the Hill uh, with regards to natural disasters, with regards to fire, earthquake. Ever since the county was dynamiting the road, we've had challenges with Portuguese Bend uh, from, the, from the 50s and 60s. So, uh, there are so many topics that we have to touch upon today, and there's a lot of them that have a real interplay with the policy work that Al and I are doing up in Sacramento in conjunction with your, uh, your, your local representatives who, who, who serve the various cities here on the Hill. Uh, you know, I just think about, you know, just, just the last couple of, of weeks, we, you know, we had a chance, I, I saw, I see the chief here, we were at the landslide at Rolling Hills Estates not too long ago, uh, trying to, uh, you know, learn about and see what we can do to give support to the city there. Uh, obviously, there's the challenge at Seaview, uh, Portuguese Bend, uh, down in, in Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, we know about uh, the, the ever-existing fire challenges. Uh, so there's a lot of, of issues that we've got to work on here. I've got a bond that I'm working on that's going to help to create some fun, new funding sources to help address uh, some of these types of natural disaster challenges. Uh, that's in the works right now. We're going to be trying to see what we can do to leverage some of our, uh, our, our partnerships up in Sacramento, but also in Washington to get some additional resources to the cities to address these landslides. But uh, it's, a, it's a, a whole set of, of, of problems. <laughs> and we unfortunately know that they're only going to get worse as, we, you know, as the weather continues to swing. Uh, that really does impact the geology and the hydrology here on the hill. Uh, you'll have periods of dryness and then suddenly tons of water, then the, the land moves. And, and, and we've got new challenges to deal with. So uh, it truly is a partnership, uh, and, and I wanted to be here to be a part of this because I, I know how, how important this is to, to everyone here and, and, and how we all are going to have to work together to, to make sure uh, that, we, that we make things, you know, make things better for folks. One thing I will mention, uh, I, I see a friend here from the Department of Insurance. Uh, one of the real challenges that we've had is in that space. The insurance commissioner had a proposal that uh, came before the legislature, at least at the very last minute. Uh, uh, they, they've been working on it for a long time, but the proposal came before us at the end of the session. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get action at, on the legislative side, but I know the insurance commissioner has taken direct action. And there's going to be a continual push and pull with the insurance market. This is a real challenge that we face uh, uh, on a, on a major, on a macro level. We've got some really strong consumer protections that are placed in Proposition 103, which are very important, and there's a lot of benefits that we need to, to preserve and protect. We also, at the same time, have several of the major insurance companies that have been pulling out of the state. They feel as though our rules are too onerous. They're also really concerned about the ever-increasing uh, uh, cost of, of, of fire, wildfire. We've seen disastrous wildfires, particularly in other parts of the state, thankfully, and I always worry about you know, making sure we're ready here. I know we are going to be ready, but I worry about it. <laughs> it's part of why we, we need to talk about it here today. 
but that's going to be a continual area of challenge too. Uh, figuring out a path moving forward to ensure that we that we have the insurance that we need here for our for our, our homes and, and our and our buildings, uh, while also doing so in a way that um, you know this is a, it's a free market and they, they can leave the state if they want to, and some of them have been doing it. And so uh, it's it's a it's a it's a tough balance, and we're working on some policy solutions to ensure that we're able to maintain strong insurance coverage for folks. So that's another area of real work. But um, I want to I want to thank my friend Al Murtsuchi for his uh, dogged focus on this on, on these sets of issues, and we really stand in in, in deep partnership in ensuring that, uh, that that these issues that we have here on the Hill are getting up to the highest levels of state government and our partners at the federal level. And I I do want to uh, just I, I see so many of my friends from local government here, and I want to thank all of you for your 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 deep devotion to your constituents and your towns and you're you, you're always reaching out to us and working with us and making sure that that uh, your constituents needs are being heard and, and we're, we're you know we're very committed to working very closely with you in the year in, in the session to come uh, to get you some resources and also some policy solutions so thank you everybody looking forward to the to the panel discussion and thank you for all the expertise here represented today thank you I appreciate it All right. Thank you very much, Senator Allen. So um, uh, let's jump into the, uh, the heart of today's event. Uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, representatives from the county and, and the state. Um, I'm going to introduce them individually, but uh, I just want to give you a quick overview of, of, of our program for the, the next uh, hour or so. Um, we are going to have presentations from the Los Angeles County Fire Department, from the Los Angeles County Office of Emergency Management, uh, from the California Office of Emergency Services, uh, and last but not least, uh, from the California Department of Insurance to address some of the insurance uh, concerns that Senator Allen um, referred to. After all of the presentations, we ask that you hold off on your questions. We will open it up to the audience for questions and answers. Um, and, uh, and that's how we're going to proceed. So let me start off uh, by introducing our first presenter. Uh, this is uh, Chief Brian Bennett. Chief Bennett has served the Los Angeles County Fire Department for 32 years. Uh, he is currently the Assistant Fire Chief of Division I, consisting of 10 cities and 22 fire stations. Chief Bennett, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, well, um, thank you to Assembly Member Marsucci and, um, and Senator Allen and everybody here today for putting this on and for allowing LA County Fire Department to be here. Uh, we think this is a really important part of, of uh, your responsibility and our responsibility as your first responders. So um, what you guys had this morning and the information that you guys received this morning not only will keep you safe, it will keep your family safe, your neighbors, your co-workers, and uh, just as important when you guys are prepared and you guys are safe, us as first responders, it makes our job that much easier. Uh, and so, real quick, I wanted to introduce your first responders here to the peninsula. If I could just have uh, our Fire Station 106 stand up with uh, Battalion Chief Ted Svoboda. <laughs> Thanks to the, the men and women that serve the, the four peninsula cities. Uh, I am uh, proud to be working alongside them. So uh, this afternoon, what I thought I'd do is go through a quick PowerPoint. And it's going to be a lot of information that you guys already had this, uh, this morning and throughout the expo. There might be some different terminology, but really the, um, the heart of it is the same. And it's about being prepared. It's about preparing yourself, preparing your homes. And um, you guys will be much better off if you put in the work now. Uh, but again, it's about planning, it's about communication, and it's about giving back. And, and with you guys all here, this is your give back and your responsibility to the community, so we thank you for that. Okay? So uh, to, um, to kind of mirror Assemblymember Marsucci, when I first started to put this program together, I could just, all I thought about was 2023 and kind of what 
it has already brought with us in, in uh, relationship to preparedness. Um, record rainfalls. I was on a conference call last uh, about two weeks ago, and I heard 26 inches, plus or minus. It's a record. Uh, whatever it's double, it's triple. It's a lot of rain that we had. And we had preparedness challenges from January all the way up into the summer months. Uh, of course, uh, land movement in Rolling Hills Estates, which we were all involved with. Um, I think we may have had an earthquake right after that, right before preparing for what was Tropical Storm Hillary. Um, it was started as a hurricane. By the time it got to us, I think it had been 80 years since we've had that. So definitely some preparedness challenges there. And then I think um, globally or um, throughout the country uh, where our hearts and our minds are with Maui and the absolute need for preparedness, for good communications, and for residents to do their part. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I'm going to kind of uh, go through LA County Fire Department's vision of how we see preparedness. Again, you might hear some little bit different terms, uh, terms but the meat and potatoes of it are the same. Uh, and that is, um, we have a website of fire.lacounty.gov, and there, um, that's kind of what the, the beginning stages of our website looks like. And through the drop-down menus, there's really good information. There's preparedness packets. Uh, there are um, plans to do the uh, fire, like fire drills in your home. We have contact numbers and links to different um, communications. So it's a really good website. We're going to uh, kind of follow through that in an abridged version. So we kind of think about um, preparedness uh, in four stages. And that's um, having a plan, a really good plan, having the proper supplies, staying informed. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, PVP ready as well as Alert South Bay and then to get involved. And just seeing all of you here this afternoon is about getting involved. You are involved now that you're here, and that's the, one of the most important parts. Next slide, please. OK, so having a plan. Being in a very high fire hazard severity zone, we always think about the dangers of wildfire. And that's our Ready, Set, Go program. But as we've seen throughout 2023, it's more than just wildfire here on the peninsula here in Southern California. Uh, earthquake and the preparedness that we need to have for earthquakes, um, for wildfires, and as well as house fires. You guys need to have a plan of what you're going to do with yourself and your family for a house fire. The flooding, we saw the um, um, in Hurricane Hillary, Tropical Storm Hillary, the, the need to, to have a plan for sandbags, know where to get the sand, know where to get the bags. And then, of course, just the basic power outage. They really all have to do with good planning, planning for long-term power outages, and uh, just doing your part there. Next slide, please. So about supplies. Uh, every individual, every family is different, but here are some of our recommendations um, to have disaster supply kits, um, multiple supply kits. So you're going to have one in your home, you're going to have one in your car, you're going to have one at work, because we really never know when this is going to happen and where we're going to be. So that's important to have multiple supply kits. Drinking water. They say one to three gallons per person per day. Myself, uh, for my family, I have a family of five, and we do about a gallon per person per day. And we try to do it for two weeks. So up to anywhere from five, five days to two weeks, that's ideal. First aid kits, have them in your car, have them in your home, know where to, know where to get them. And then don't forget about your pets, right? There's some, especially our large animals here on the hill and your pets, they, they need food, they need water as well. So have that as part of your kits. And so I just put some pictures up there. One of the things I use is from Home Depot, we'll go get the, the black and yellow containers. They stack real well. I put them off uh, in a corner of the attic and it's a really good way to uh, store non-perishable supplies. Next slide, please. Okay, staying informed. Um, there are a lot of local emergency uh, systems for our unincorporated areas. We use Alert LA County. Uh, and then what we'll talk a little bit more in depth is the PVP ready and know your zone, how important it is to know where your zone is, um, what part of your neighborhood the zone is. Sometimes it might be a neighborhood, some, sometimes it might be two neighborhoods. So that's really important to know that. And then Alert South Bay, it's a system where uh, you register and they will 
um, when there is an event, they'll get you through your cell phone either by text or by your cell phone to let you know that there's either been a change in your zone or there's something going on. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, staying informed and knowing your zone. Uh, you guys have all probably heard about Zone Haven. Uh, and that is a platform that identifies zones within your neighborhood. And um, the best way to do that is to log into the PVP Ready, and you can type in your address, and you'll find out where your zone is. There'll be maps there. It's a really easy link through PVP Ready. And I just found out that um, the Gen so Genesis is the parent company to Zone Haven. And they have a new app that they're developing that'll have automatic texting that'll override um, silence and everything when there's a change to your zone. And just for the land movement, uh, we've um, updated zones in rolling, both Rolling Hills Estates and Rancho Palos Verdes just to uh, put in advisories. So those are there. If you happen to log into Zone Haven, you'll see the advisories. When you click on that zone, it'll tell you exactly uh, what's going on and recommendations. And then ultimately during an evacuation, that's where our first responders will decide um, priority for evacuation, and that will be in your zone. Uh, you know, Palos Verdes Peninsula has limited means of egress, and it's going to be really important when you know your zone how you as uh, the residents are going to get out and how we are going to get in. Okay, next slide, please. So this is more about the uh, PVP Ready website. Uh, memorize your zone, uh, write it down, talk, exchange information with your neighbors, uh, pack a go bag, make a plan, and practice your plan. You have to practice your plan. Next slide, please. So here's what it looks like in the PVP Ready website. Super, just a couple clicks, put in your address, and your zone will pop up and populate. So Alert South Bay, that's one of the local um, alerting systems that uh, you'll need to register. And uh, Alert South Bay, once you register, uh, they will also give you updates on any changes in zones or uh, just basic emergency information within your community. All right, next slide. So uh, here is how to register. You can do it online at alertsouthbay.com. And you'll download and sign up through, or you can download and sign up through Everbridge. And some of the local cities also have a direct, like Rolling Hills Estates, you can text RHE Alerts to 888-777, and that will register you. And then make sure you know what your local city's um, local information sharing is, whether it's a website or emails. Always stay up on that. Um, so RPV uses my RPV. Uh, they have an app, and PV Estates uses Nixle. Okay. So then the next part is getting involved, which we're, with you guys all here, this is, this is the biggest part, is, is getting involved and staying involved with your community. Uh, so there's neighborhood networks, neighborhood watch, there's block captains. Um, we've been involved up in Rolling Hills for a lot of the block captains, and they do a fantastic job with managing their neighbors and their neighborhood. And of course, CERT, I don't know if there's any CERT. Um, we have a fantastic CERT program and a CERT certification that's happening as we speak. I'm sorry, um, for those, uh, Rosemary Vivero, she's your community service liaison. She's one of our lead CERT instructors. And she's, uh, any CERT information, you can go uh, to Rosemary or to uh, the CERT website. Back just one moment. Oh, that's okay. Um, and then, so just the, the basics of uh, attending the sidewalk CPR, uh, knowing hands-only CPR, knowing, uh, taking a first aid class, all those are about getting involved uh, helping yourself, helping your family, helping your community, helping your neighbors, helping your coworkers, and uh, the, we through the American Red Cross, or you can go to our website with local um, first aid classes and uh, things that can help you get prepared. Next slide. So I, I, I believe we're going to um, save questions for uh, afterwards. But again, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Again, this is this stay involved part. Uh, hopefully you got some really good information, and again, thank you um, to you for uh, some of them, Marsucci, for allowing us to be here and setting it up, and uh, congratulations to all of you for being here. And uh, we'll have some questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I uh, just wanted to emphasize uh, the the know your zone. I I 
was just making sure that I was signed up, and uh, I, I, I am in RHE E12, so that is my zone. And, and the reason why I emphasize that is, is that uh, I, I forget if uh, Senator Allen uh, also did the tour, but uh, uh, we went up to uh, the city of Paradise, which, uh, as you may recall, uh, was the worst uh, wildfire uh, in, in the history of the state of California in terms of the number of deaths. And as we were driving to Paradise, there, were, there was like a, a two-lane road that was going into Paradise. And I, as I was on that two-lane road, I was thinking, this looks a lot like Palos Verdes. You know, in, in terms of the, the limited, the, the Chief Bennett talked about the limited ingress-egress. And that's where it becomes so critical that we, you know, uh, are signed up for all of these uh, alert systems. I'm, I'm also on the Alert South Bay. Um, but uh, it's, it's so critical that we are, we get the immediate alerts so that we can evacuate immediately uh, in the case of, you know, anything from wildfires to, uh, to earthquakes uh, to, to landslides. So thank you very much, Chief, for your, your presentation. Next, we have uh, from the Los Angeles Office of Emergency Management, Gene O'Donnell. Uh, Gene is a senior program officer. Uh, and is in charge of the Emergency Operations Center during uh, dis disaster activations. Uh, she also directs operations for county, local assistance centers, and uh, has uh, led uh, numerous planning projects uh, related to uh, disaster responses. Uh, please welcome Jean O'Donnell. Uh, thank you for the promotion. Um, I do not run the Emergency Operations Center. Uh oh, I think I messed this up. Um, I definitely work there and I'm a part of that daily operation. I can hold it. <laughs> that might be the better way to go. Um, but, but the Office of Emergency Management is the first line of county and regionalizing emergency support, emergency resources in the county. So of all the 58, uh, 88 cities within the county, one of the things that we're charged with is pulling together the information, coordinating it, and moving it up to the state so we have a good assessment of what we look like in Los Angeles County. Where are our needs? Where are the pressures? Where do we need to pay more attention to what's happening? Are all of our cities, are all of our police departments and our fire agencies, are they mission capable? So one of the things that we're doing all the time in the Emergency Operations Center is watching for that. And I do want to say, and the Chief said it, and, and you said it as well, the most movement in this business is in alerts and warnings in the last few years. I've been doing this since the 1987 earthquake. And the emphasis on alerts and warnings, if you don't take advantage of it, I don't know what else we can do because it is the hottest, most important thing. If you don't know what's coming, you don't know when to put your plan into effect. So I did want to emphasize that because you both said it, and it's just so critically important that somehow or another you have trusted, respected information that is vetted from people that know what they're talking about. The wonderfulness about social media is also the most horrible thing about social media, and that is rumors get out there and we look at information and we don't know that it's coming from a credible source. Please look at the ones that we are talking about today. These are credible sources. These are vetted sources. These are ones the fire department is using, the sheriff's department is using, and in general, we're all using in order to make sure that you get correct information and that the safety actions you take are consistent with what the threat is. That was a little tiny bit of a soapbox. <laughs> but I did want to um, just say what we are. So we're part of the chief executive office. So we're not part of fire. We're not part of law. We're not part of health. We are actually belong to the Board of Supervisors, if you want to put it that way. We belong to the chief executive office. So we deal with a lot of coordination and policy and a lot of planning on the macro level. So what we're doing here is we're constantly looking at what resources do we have and what issues are popping up. We spend a lot of time coordinating with our own county departments. We have 36 county departments and 100,000 employees. We have a lot of resources in Los Angeles County. Not many counties can say that. In fact, no county can say what Los Angeles County can say. Just the sheer number of our fire or professional firefighters is unusual. We have a really, really great professional force of emergency responders in Los Angeles County. But we have to know where to put them and where the threats are. We have to know where the needs are before we can understand where to put those resources. There's also a lot of county departments that provide services you probably didn't know about. There's probably services that you, you had no idea were out there because you're not using those services a lot or you actually haven't personally experienced a disaster. 
that's what our office is there. We're constantly going to the Department of Public Health and Public Works and, and the coroner's department, excuse me, the medical examiner, that's a, a new uh, name change there. Um, we're, you know, EMS agency, all of these different areas where we have a lot of resources, up to and including the libraries, because they're one of our really great sources of information and uh, ways of getting information out and supporting communities on the, feet, on the ground. So the county really does have a lot of resource that we can bring to bear on a disaster. And I think for, um, I don't know if anybody here I talked to, but I was here um, after the um, land movement. And that's what we tried to do, was bring in all the resources here so you could see what options could be available. We're never going to solve the whole problem, but we can provide some pretty critical puzzle pieces. The other thing that we're doing is we're actually talking to Cal OES, and Cheryl's going to talk and tell what that, that role is. But Cal OES is how we say, what is the state of Los Angeles County right now? What do we need? What do we need to be in standby for? Do we need technical assistance? Do we need help in getting waivers? Do we need help in our proclamations? Do we need help in bringing a resource in that isn't currently here? You have a unique situation out here, well, not too unique, sadly, um, and that is that you can get cut off pretty easily. We, we talk about the Antelope Valley that way. You have a similar problem here. If you get cut off, we will definitely be working with Cal OES to look at what resources we can bring into the region to help communities that are cut off in the, in, this, in the wake of a major disaster. So those are some of the things that we're constantly strategizing about. Those are the things that we're talking about quite a bit. And then recovery coordination. Um, proclamations are certainly one part of it, and that's one of the mechanisms that we have to ask the state and the federal government for assistance. But the other part of it is working with our nonprofits. And I actually, when I was putting the notes together for this, I thought, you know, I don't talk about this group often enough, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it right now. We have a whole network of nonprofits that help people in disasters. Emergency Network Los Angeles has nothing in it except uh, large churches and organizations, Red Cross, Suchi Foundation, Habitat for Humanity, you name it. If they're involved in the disaster business, they are coordinating with ENLA. And ENLA is then coming out to provide services when they're needed. I just want to say this because I'm not sure we know that enough and give them enough credit and also support it uh, well enough. These are people who are there on the really bad days. And I have to tell you, there is not a quarter that goes by that I'm not on the phone with them asking them for help in one portion of the county or not because we don't have the resource, the state doesn't have the resource, and the only place we can go is to the nonprofit world. So, you know, be sure to support and, and include nonprofits when you're doing your emergency planning and understand what they're there for. And then I always have to say, I have to do this plug and volunteer. You know, become a disaster volunteer. If you're here at this meeting, you're halfway down that road. You know, you can be part of the solution, not part of the piece that we're trying to figure out how to solve the problem for. So those are kind of the basic functions. The other things that's going on, we do have a 24-7 right now. If you called my office, you would get one of my colleagues. Um, we are on 24-7 monitoring things that are going on in the county or things that could affect the county. Not everything that happens here is because it happened here. It's sometimes we get ripple effects. So we have somebody who's constantly talking to the weather service. We have people looking at talking to the um, big part of the shakeout. Did everybody do the shakeout this week? Show of hands. Does everybody hear about the shakeout this week? <laughs> a few more people, okay. I mean, you know, we, we can laugh, we can say, ah, oh, shakeout. But there is no other way for us to consistently change our behaviors and work with disasters in a meaningful way on a personal level than the shakeout. So I would encourage you to not only sign up every year so that we have those numbers. It is the largest earthquake drill in the world. It started here in Southern California. It actually started when I was just started with the county, so it's kind of fun for me. Um, and it's, it's got an amazing set of resources that will help your planning. Alerts and warnings, I kind of said it already, but I'll say it again. I mean, one of the big things we're doing is trying to get alerts and warnings that are appropriate, actionable, and that you understand out in a timely manner. And our partners, the sheriff and, and the fire department, if we, we, we're not in the field. My office is not in the field. They are in the field. So we're just translating that information to make sure that it gets out to the widest group of people possible. So it's a huge and very serious part of what we do on a daily basis. 
Planning and preparedness, I mean, we, we do a lot of that. Um, it's never fun to say that one of my projects in the last few years has been mass fatality planning, but it has been. Um, but also don donations management, volunteer management, animal response and rescue. Uh, I can't even think of all the sheltering, mass care. All of these are huge plans that have to exist on the county level if we're going to pull it off in the major disaster. So our office is constantly reviewing, updating, and coming up with strategies to support those plans. And public information, because that's a big part of what we do um, in supporting these, these huge operations. That's tricky, right? You, you can never really have enough well-coordinated public information. Um, and really, the county, for the most part, if it didn't happen in unincorporated areas, we're supporting the city where it's happened. We don't come over and say, hey, this is how you do it. We go to the city and say, what you're trying to do, do you need more resources? Can you get more friends to help? If you don't, we have a few that can come and help. So again, we're in a supportive role for most of our, of our daily lives. And then grants management, um, and that's really basically how we can fund some of this, is we, we bring in grants, we work on hazard mitigation grants, um, we have uh, just grants to support our, our operations, to improve planning, and um, weather radios. And I don't know that we have really promoted them out here, but uh, I'll take a, a little note of that. One of the big, really cool things we've done in the last year is worked with the National Weather Service to get fire and evacuation alerts out on NOAA weather radios. People who live in areas, in canyons and places where you don't get good cell reception, you can usually get reception on a weather radio. So by partnering with the National Weather Service to get those messages out, you in your own home can have that. And if you are outside, you can walk in and look and go, oh, look, a message came in while I was outside. So it's a really great one-way radio um, system that you can acquire if you get a radio. On our website, we have all the information on how to program it. We also do have a supply that we do hand out. Uh, we try to keep those to areas in very high fire severity zones, but also um, really for people who um, were purchasing a radio for themselves might be a challenge. So the, the alerts and warning and public information, grants management, they're all just kind of caught up in one another. And then these are just places I wanted to point out, and especially finding information, that top web page. If you go to the county website right now and click on emergency, that's what you're going to see. Because we're always waiting for when something happens, we want to be able to tell you where the shelters are, where roads are closed, where the animal shelters are. All of that information, you can see this page is not activated because we don't have something going on right now. But this is 24-7, that page is live and ready. So that, that is something that you should bookmark on your computer or have marked in your plans. Uh, Alert LA County, we've talked about that. Um, this area has a lot of it, but sign up for all of them. Get them all. And then 211 Los Angeles County is another one. 211 is the general information referral line for the county to get information. I see a couple head nods, so some of you know about it, but many people don't. Um, but really it is the way to get information when you really need to know something, you don't know where else to turn. In a way, it's kind of like the operator of the old days, except it's for services, uh, for human type services. So just those are some things that you can remember. And I'm gonna end by saying, and I think, I, I think that was my last slide, but I'll end by saying, Please pick up one of the emergency survival guides and all of these things that I heard that you want to remember. We put blank pages in there all over the place so you can write this stuff down. Please grab a guide before you leave. If you need it in another language for yourself or another family member or a friend, we have it in 14 languages online. We also have it in audio in English, audio in Spanish. We no longer have the Braille ones because honestly they were like this big and uh, they, they fell apart pretty quickly. Um, but we've tried to accommodate every other obstacle uh, that, that you might have to getting that information, getting the correct information, and really being able to tailor it to your own personal situation at home. And I'm going to end with that. Thank you very much, Jean. I, uh, I, I, I know that uh, when we had the landslide in Rolling Hills Estates, uh, it, it was really uh, the, the, the city and, and uh, the county, especially uh, Supervisor Ahan, who were out there immediately. And uh, they, they, they were the first responders. So thank you very much uh, for um, our, our fire department, our LA County Fire Department, as well as the County Office of Emergency Management. But of course, you know, this uh, response of uh, 
uh, toward uh, disasters as, as local, county, state, and federal. And so next uh, we have uh, from the California Office of Emergency Services, Cheryl Jones. Uh, Cheryl Jones is a Senior Emergency Services Coordinator. Uh, she is the Cal OES Lead Liaison for Los Angeles. Um, and uh, as the Emergency Services Coordinator, she has uh, uh, served in leadership roles for numerous task forces, disaster and recovery operations, and serve in command staff positions in various levels of emergency operations centers. Please welcome Cheryl Jones. broke it. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Cheryl Jones, as he said, and I'm with the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. We are part of the Governor's Office. We're one of the five offices housed in the Governor's Office. Is it off? Oh, okay. Housed in the Governor's Office. Um, our role is to facilitate state emergency response, preparedness, and recovery operations for the 58 counties, the operational areas. There's one of me, emergency services coordinator, assigned to the 58 counties. LA County is big enough to where we have two emergency services coordinator. I am the lead. Um, as part of the governor's office, we uh, facilitate state response to local jurisdictions. All disasters are local, but when there's a need for ex increased resources or assistance, we have the authority to, to task any state agency. We are also the local jurisdiction's conduit to the federal government for federal disaster the, the recovery um, resources, for business recovery resources, and for preparedness and grant recovery resources. Um, our director is the state advisor, is the national advisory for home, homeland security, and we have numerous uh, disciplines housed in our agency, in our department. We are not an agent, state agency, we're part of the governor's office. Um, we're, not a, we're not a first responder, we are a support agency. So we have fire, we have law, we have resource, um, fire, I'm sorry, fire, law, grants, recovery, uh, response operations, which I am a part of, um, uh, has, hazardous materials, and we operate a 24-hour warning center. It's the state's 911 system, it's housed, it's operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it is the first notification for most local jurisdictions when there's a hazardous spill, um, any type of disaster, and we operate that, they'll funnel that out to our duty officers who will be in contact with the local jurisdictions to get more information because the governor is really interested in a lot of any information, any disaster or emergency that hits any local jurisdiction. Our, our main responsibilities are planning and preparedness, response and recovery. With planning, we have just completed the initial draft of the state emergency plan, um, the Southern California earthquake plan, the, uh, the Northern California earthquake plan, hazard mitigation plan. Um, there's, a, there's a wide variety of plans that local plans feed into for us to have a state response. We provide direct disaster response and recovery resources to the local jurisdictions. When, when uh, local jurisdictions proclaim a, uh, an emergency and request resources. Um, there can, it can either be federal resources or it can be standalone state resources. We have, through the California Disaster Assistance Act and that's at the discretion of the governor. Now with the California Disaster uh, Assistance Act, it may not be monetary, it may be through state assistance um, from any one of our state agency partners, which we do have the authority to a task to lo assist the local jurisdiction. Um, we do, I'm sorry, I didn't, even, I didn't even tell you to click. I forgot. <laughs> okay, so we are at uh, the functions. Yeah, there we go. Um, we um, are housed, I, am, I operate out of the Los Angeles County operational area, so I report to OEM. When there is an emergency and they activate their ELC, and even when they don't, we are usually there. 
um, to provide state support and to, and to initially kind of feed the beast because we gather information from the counties who gather information from the local jurisdictions and feed it up to our state operations center who feeds it to the governor. The governor is usually in our state operations center when there is a disaster. He's usually in the way, but he's usually there <laughs> to, to assist and make sure that the counties are getting ex exactly what they need. Um, we do feed that up, um, and that helps feed into our request to the federal government for federal disaster declarations and federal assistance. Next slide. We do have a website, and I don't know, I know this may be kind of hard to see, but it's called My Hazards, and it's a wonderful website. If you can, uh, if you can zoom your camera in close enough, you can get that QR code and it'll take you directly to that website. You can input your address, and it'll tell you your, the hazards that are in your area, that'll affect your area. And they'll tell you the probability and give you, the, uh, give you um, resources that may be able to help you prepare better um, in case of a disaster. Um, so this is something that we really promote. It does have a disclaimer at the beginning because it's not giving you, you know, a lot of specific information. Uh, it's giving you specific information, but it's not, you know, it's not the standalone information you may need. You may need to do some more research for yourself to be better prepared as a resident, as a community member, and as a neighborhood. Next. And then next, um, Gina mentioned the ShakeOut. The Great American ShakeOut is every year in October. Um, this year it was on 1019 at 1019. And I know most of your kids dropped covered and held on. I didn't drop in cover because I have bad knees. But I, I, I was there and I participated. But this, is, this app is called MyShake. And it's an app that our agency actually promotes. And it can give you up to 30 seconds notification before an earthquake so that you can get in a safe place. Um, and then you can also, we did an event at Loyola Marymount University. And most of the students had never been through an earthquake. They were from out of the country or out of state. So we had a lot of kids register for the mic, download the MyShake app. They also sent it to their parents in their, in their home cities and states. And their parents also downloaded the app and put their, their child's school address as their home base so that they can receive notification as well. So um, we had a lot of thankful parents. Um, we, had, we had a lot of people that registered for the MyShake app in Asia and in Europe, uh, which, was, which was pretty cool because uh, it, made, it made the kids feel a lot better because, you know, kids are fearless, but it made the parents, gave the parents a peace of mind. During the, the uh, earthquake we had in Ojai during the tropical storm, some people received up to 15 to 20 seconds notification. Thought it was a mistake because it's like, what are you talking about an earthquake? And then when the earthquake hit, it's like, oh, it does work. I was one of those people like, oh, yeah, it does work. I was kind of happy because I've been promoting it for the past couple of years. Okay, so um, this is it. Uh, my name is Cheryl Jones. I'm based out of Los Angeles uh, Office of Emergency Management. Our office is in Santa Ana. We cover the 11, sub the 11 region, 11 counties of the southern region from Mono County down and around up to San Luis Obispo County. There is approximately 20 of us in the office. Um, we discipline from tactical communications, recovery, response, law, fire, health hazmat, um, but I am easy to reach if you need any additional information. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Oh, Cheryl, are these your notes here? No? Are these yours? Okay. Thank you. All right. I, I know that uh, when I was listening to Cheryl, the, 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 the key word that she used that I was focused in on is resources, because I know that uh, I, 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 I see Aura Moranian over there, but uh, we, we, we know that uh, we're going to be uh, uh, looking to the state to try to uh, uh, help with FEMA's uh, $23 million grant for the, um, the, the, the water um, relief system that uh, that uh, they're, they're trying to address to uh, for, the, for the land movement and so uh, we'll be following up on that Cheryl thank you very much last but not least is Julia Juarez uh, she is deputy commissioner of the California Department of Insurance uh, she has served uh, over 25 years in both the public and private sector in terms of uh, uh, right now she she oversees constituent outreach uh, 
uh, with the California Department of Insurance, uh, assisting wildfire survivors, local governments, small businesses, and consumers in accessing the department's many services. Uh, please welcome uh, Julia Juarez. Hello, everyone. Are you all ready for the technical stuff? So, <laughs> well, I am. It is a pleasure to be here uh, with you on behalf of uh, Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara. Thank you. Thank you for being here and, and getting informed uh, so that you know exactly what is going on uh, with our insurance market, how does that relate to you um, and to the state as a whole, and what you can do uh, to uh, help uh, yourselves and your neighbors along with that. So um, I'm going to be talking with you in regards to the California Sustainable uh, Insurance Strategy, which is uh, what we are working on right now uh, as, a, as a department. So we, uh, the strategy is very much so looking at modernizing the way that we do insurance as a whole uh, with the state. We have um, right now, how many of you have heard of all of the you know, different insurance companies not doing any business in the state? How many of you have heard that, you know, companies leaving the state? All right, so let me tell you something. Nobody's leaving the state. California happens to be the largest insurance market in the entire United States. And it is only second to China in the entire world. So that means that everybody's doing business in California. It is good to do business in California. However, there are a lot of risks in California. And so because of that, uh, insurance markets are, you know, are, are looking at, insurance companies are, are, you know, taking a step back and just trying to figure out what's going to happen. So uh, we are working very hard to make sure that the, uh, the, the market as a whole is resilient. The Department of Insurance and the Commissioner is very much a, the consumer protection agent for you. They are very, you know, we are very much in making sure that insurance companies are not discriminating against you or not doing something that is inappropriate for you. That is absolutely number one what we do as a department. The other thing is making absolutely sure that insurance companies have the money to pay their claims, that insurance companies as a whole are able to do the business that they need to do. Insurance companies are not utilities. They don't have to sell you anything, and we can't make them. It's not, uh, it's a business, just like any other, and uh, if they do decide they don't want to do anything, they don't want to sell anything, there's nothing we can do about that. So we, want, we need to make absolutely sure that the market as a whole is healthy and that you are able to get what you, uh, what you need to be able to, um, to, to take care of your home and your, your, uh, yourselves uh, after a disaster. And then uh, we, will, you know, we are absolutely continuing to make sure that we are protecting you, uh, you know, through uh, all, of the, all of the climate change issues that we are having. So, uh, the, so let me tell you what's going on globally. Just so that you, you know, we understand what is happening, what is actually happening. Insurance companies are not just, uh, you know, don't just do business in, in California or in the state. They do business all over the world. These are conglomerates, right? And so their risk throughout the world has actually just skyrocketed. So we have had, not, you know, of course we know of Maui and all of that, but we, you remember uh, just a year ago, uh, you know, Texas had this huge, uh, you know, horrible winter where, you know, major things happened there. Florida is always having some type of issue. Um, and so, and that's just here in the states where, you know, Colorado, every, every state almost has had major issues. But then we're looking at, you know, throughout the world, there is, there are just horrendous things happening. And so all of that, is very much so affecting the insurance market as a whole, as it is. Um, so what they're, uh, you know, so uh, that along with, of course, we had the pandemic that just brought everything to a standstill. And so uh, because of that, we have had the supply chain uh, basically just, you know, just 
was just disrupted uh, completely. And so then we have seen, of course, then inflation has just gone berserk, right? So everything is expensive. Everything is, is getting more expensive. So now, in order for them to replace a home, a roof, anything else, everything has just gone up tremendously. So it's costing a lot more uh, to be able to to cover. So that's so you, you know. So you understand, this is what's happening globally. The other part of that, besides rebuilding, insurance companies. Did you all know that insurance companies have insurance for themselves? Uh, they do, and that is uh, it's called reinsurance. And so they go and they get uh, they get insurance for themselves as well, right? Normally, reinsurance never. Is, is never used because insurance companies are very well easily be, being able to take care of everything that has happened. Um, now, reinsurance is actually being used and uh, reinsurance companies are all based out of Bermuda. So what do you think that means? Nobody's regulating reinsurance companies. So because of that, um, their, you know, their prices are also just skyrocketing. And so now insurance companies are having a hard time trying to figure out how to get that as well. So they you know, those, those prices are going up. Everything is going up for them there. And so then as all of the risk everywhere is happening, they're, you know, they're trying to like look at everything that, okay, where, where is my risk? How can I make my risk smaller so that I know that I can take care of what I have to? So uh, let's go to the next slide. What does that mean to you? That means that in California, 85% of all our homeowners insurance is done by 12 companies only. And I'm sure you have heard all of them because you know all of the all of the jingles, right? And uh, and even though we have 115 companies in the state that sell homeowners insurance, most of us will if, if you will happen to be in one of those, eventually you will change and you you will go to the one of those top 12. And it is just because you know they're a good neighbor. Uh, and, or, you know, little things like that that you absolutely think, okay, well, you know, that's, that's the good company that I should, I should go to them. Well, what that is happening is, uh, that if, you know, because they are the top 12, seven of them have decided, hold up, we have way too much risk in California. We need to stop selling new insurance. So nobody has left because there's too much money in California. Our homes cost a lot more money than anywhere else. So that means that even though, you know, we, ha we, may, we may pay less than everywhere else in, this, in the country, uh, we're still, our homes are worth a lot more, so they're making more money with us anyway. So they're not going anywhere. They're just stopping the, the new business that they're doing. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, if you see, oh, and I use yellow, and I apologize, you can't see that. Uh, but if you look at the top 12 companies that we have, and you can't see the last one, uh, but um, if you see all the top, the top 12 companies, we have State Farm is the highest one, the market share 21.2%, 22%. Farmers is right behind it at 14%, 14.9%. Then everybody else comes down to 6.9%. So who have you heard of? Right? Who has, who's actually stopped, you know, doing, uh, doing business altogether, just waiting, uh, on, on what are they doing? Of course, State Farm. State Farm has the highest risk in California. So that is why they, you know, they're just, they're just looking and, and seeing. And by the way, all insurance companies have done this in the past. They have, you know, they have just, you know, done all of this stuff. Um, we have uh, one, uh, farmers just said, you know, we're only going to do 7,000 new policies every year. That has pretty much been the case all, you know, all the time anyway. That's how much they have done. But it is very much so right now a lot more people are looking for insurance because it's a lot, a, a lot of them are, are just kind of, trying to get, get rid of that risk. Um, and if you see the next thing, beside the market share, the next thing you see there is the rate increases that they have asked for because, of course, what you're hearing in the media is, um, oh, well, it's because the Department of Insurance is not allowing us to charge what we're supposed to charge, you know? Uh, well, 
we, there's a lot more to that, to it than that, but in here, we're, you're looking at all of them, all of these have rate increases that they have either been approved already or are pending with the department. And they're pretty hefty increases now, right? But when we are meeting with the, with the presidents of the, the CEOs of these companies and we're talking to them about it, they're very much so saying, look, we can't, even if you, if you, if you gave us those increases, and, and all of that, we're, that's not going to get us out of the red where we are right now. It's a lot more to it because there's a lot more that they're, that they're dealing with. So next, next slide. So what, the one thing that, just so that you get, you understand the whole thing here, it's very much over the last 10 years, the insurance industry here in California has um, has actually the the incurred loss ratio has been 73.9 percent, and a, around the country it has been about 53, 53.7. The profit, their underwriting profit in throughout the country has been about 3.6 percent. California minus 13. They're they're losing money. 13.1. The direct profit on insurance transactions throughout the country, 4.2. In California, minus 6.1. So they're, they're continue, you can see, you know, where, where we're going here. Uh, and then, of course, the, the return on net worth throughout the country, 7%. In California, 0.8%. And these are numbers that we actually get from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. What they do is they review all of, you know, the market. In, you know, throughout the country. So every year we get a, um, you know, a, a, a report. So this was from January 2023. So if you're looking at the last 10 years, this is what has been happening. There's, there, there's a lot more, you know, going on there. So how do we deal with this? How do we get here? Right. So, because of all of the insurance companies doing a doing a slow roll, <laughs> you know, throughout all of this, we have the insurance of last resort, which is the fair plan. Have you all heard of the fair plan? Yeah. Um, some of you have. So, the fair plan is the insurance of last resort. The fair plan was created after the Watts riots in the 60s because nobody wanted to insure this, the, that South LA neighborhood. So then the legislature created that, and it's basically every insurance company that is doing business in the state, they put money in depending on their market share into the fair plan. So then when you are, you know, uh, uh, you, when you have the fair plan, um, they pay out, you know, because of that money that they have available. Uh, in, in store, right? In, in their stores. However, uh, what happens is for the last, you know, obviously for the last seven years or so, I mean, 10 years or so, well, five years especially, we have had the worst fires in the, in the state. We have had, we have had everything, <laughs> really, uh, in, uh, in the state. We have even had, you know, everything. Anyway, so we have, um, because of that, the, the number of policies in the fair plan has gone up to 3% in the entire state. So for some people in some communities, particularly in the, in, in the state, and, and you know, you would think immediately, oh, it's probably those communities right by Lake Tahoe or, you know, whatever. No, this is a statewide issue. We have seen these numbers go up tremendously. And so what we are seeing is that the fair plan has, instead of being the insurance of last resort in some areas, it's the only insurance available uh, for, for those people. So that is a problem because even if there is a major catastrophe and the fair plan goes down, everybody goes down because then the state is going to be on the hook or you're, you're going to be completely out of it. So we cannot allow that to happen. Um, and I just heard actually from another event where the fair plan was a part of that they're looking at about a thousand applications a day. So that means that we are like they are, you know, in particular communities, they are very much so. It's, it's a major, major issue. Uh, and AM Best has downgraded some of the biggest, you know, the, the, the top 12 companies 
um, in, in their uh, risk because of the concentration of risk here in California. So those are the major things that we're, that we're looking at and, and how, you know, we have been, um, we have gotten here. So insurance companies are not writing. And then, of course, our rate filings are more complex because there's a lot more that they're taking into consideration. So when they are asking for new, uh, to, to be able to charge what they need, um, there's that whole process there that is, that is just, is just taking long. And then California, because of Proposition 103, we have a system where we can't, there are several things that we can't do. And one of them is um, we, we are not, a, we, are, we don't allow them to charge uh, reinsurance rates to the consumer. So they have to take care of it on their own, right? Well, some insurance companies are, what they're doing is they're actually passing that, that to actual brokers or their insurance agents. And so then the actual people in the community that are working are the ones that are paying the brunt of that, and that's not, that's not uh, sustainable either. Um, so there's that. But then because of Proposition 103, we also have a system of, it's an intervener system. And that means that any one particular organization can come in and say, oh, this insurance company wants to ask, you know, wants to uh, increase rates this much. We don't agree with it. So you need to stop that, right? Um, and so then, the, you know, even though, and normally what has happened is the Department of Insurance reviews all of this. Um, in the, the system that we have, if you go, if you ask for more than 7% increase, then it goes to, uh, to a review, uh, public, like a public hearing, public review. In the 23 years that we have had the system set up, uh, that has only gone to hearing once. But the intervener system is set up so that then this organization is just saying, uh, no, we don't agree with it. They're basically cutting and pasting what the department has found that they need to work on and that they're, they're, uh, they're working with the department to fix. And they're saying, well, they, these are the issues. Um, but they can, they can hold the, pro the system down up to two years. So then insurance companies are not able to, um, you know, to, to get the rates that they need, right, because of that. And then this intervener gets paid by the state for what they're doing, and then they get paid by the insurance company for what they're doing. So it's kind of a business, right? So it's, it's getting into the, it's, it's, it's not helping the way that we're, that, that we do um, our rates to move them forward. So what we're, you know, so when the commissioner came on board, insurance companies were, were saying, okay, we'll ask for 6.9%, but when we got the, the, the applications, we're looking at them, these people need 20% increase to be able to be, uh, you know, solvent. But they wouldn't ask for that, and we weren't gonna tell them charge more, so then, you know, we would just say, okay, fine, you get the 6.9%. Well, when they finally got the 6.9%, guess what they did the very next day? apply again. So then it was just a roller, you know, roller coaster of that. So when Commissioner Lara came on board, he said, okay, this is crazy. This does not work. Let's make this. So you ask me exactly what you need. And so that is why we have the earlier, the earlier uh, slide that I showed you that is actually, you know, that's bigger percentages because this is exactly what they need to be able to be solvent. So, but that's, that's different. So those are the major issues that we have and that's how we got here where we are right now. Next, next. And I, I'll try to be quick. Sorry about that. Uh, but, um, so the, the sustainable uh, insurance strategy is basically, it's, it's what the commissioner was able to work out with the insurance companies, with the, with consumers, and be, uh, and so we are going to have insurance companies write policies in 85% of the areas where the fair plan has the most amount of policies, where people can't find insurance. So now it's 85% of their new policies are gonna to have to be there. The next part of that is it's going to have to make sure that the, that people are getting out of the fair plan to be to be um, covered by the regular market, which means these are folks that are um, and the ones that are going to get first dibs to be able to get out of the fair plan and do this 
are the folks that have done the mitigation work in their home, that their home is safer from wildfires. And it's part of the work that we have done this last year on uh, making sure that consumers are able to be safer uh, by fixing their home, their immediate surroundings, and then working with their community to make sure that their community is safe. So all of that is part of um, part of the uh, the way that they're going to be brought back to the to, to the insurance market, and then the catastrophe models. Normally, insurance companies, when they ask for insurance, when they uh, when they are uh, looking at how much they're going to charge you for your premiums, they looked at like the last five years of uh, of losses that they've incurred in in particular areas. But that does it doesn't fly anymore because there's just been so many like just climate change has just taken this so different. So now what we're working. Uh, we're doing hearings and working with them and, uh, and the experts on this is what is catastrophe modeling? How do we make sure that the consumer is getting exactly what they should pay? And so look at very specifically a home and look at their parcel, look at, look at their surroundings, make sure that if they can see that community is actually safer, then their premiums should be lowered. So those are the, that's the way that, uh, that, that catastrophe modeling is supposed to be working. And then we're, go we're going to be looking at also uh, the reinsurance portion. Commissioner Lara went to Bermuda, met with these folks, and tried to understand what is, you know, how in the world do you guys, you know, put all this together? And, uh, and then uh, is, he's working with experts to try to find out how do we make absolutely sure that if California allows for reinsurance, that it is only the risk that California is incurring that is going to be um, added into in, into the premiums that we are not going to be paying for Texas or for Florida or for India, but rather it's only California risk. So those are things that we are working on. And then the last part is modernizing the fair plan. When Commissioner Lara came on board, the fair plan was uh, only allowing insurance for homes uh, up to 1.5 million dollars. That doesn't cover anybody anymore in California, right? Like, or, or at least, you know, a, a big number of folks are, are going to be without insurance. So Commissioner Lara increased, uh, asked the fair plan to increase it to three million. For, uh, businesses, as, you know, was 3.5 million. We increased it to seven million. And that, it's still, you know, wasn't, isn't enough. What we have also found then, uh, so then he was, he asked for these changes, but then also making sure that the fair plan was able to give insurance as a whole. Because when you go to the fair plan, you will get fire insurance or wildfire insurance, but then you have to buy difference in conditions insurance separately. That means you've got to buy two different policies from two different, you know, places, and you get a lot less coverage than you did before. And so that's not helping anybody. That's not helping. So the commissioner asked, let's just do one full wraparound insurance. Guess what the fair plan did? They sued the commissioner. Uh, and they said there's no way because then the fair plan is going to be competing with insurance companies. And, ins and then and the fair plan is not run by the state. The fair plan is run by insurance companies. The insurance companies are the ones that are on the board of the fair plan and make all the rules for the fair plan. So that is the difference. Uh, that is what is happening in the fair plan. So now we are, the commission will find, uh, it's, uh, made a, a deal with the fair plan where now they're going to move, uh, for commercial insurance to 20 million per, uh, property. And so that means that, uh, homeowners insur homeowners insurance, uh, you're going to be able to buy, uh, not homeowners insurance, excuse me, HOAs, uh, are going to be able to purchase that. However, in some areas, 20 million for the whole thing is not enough. So um, right now in November, you're going to be able to, to have uh, insurance up to 20 million. Uh, the expectation is that we are going to get all of this done, the commissioner uh, asked the department, and the reason for the governor's uh, uh, executive order was uh, to make sure that we can move everything quickly because we know government works very slowly. Uh, but if we're able to, because of the executive order, that it is an emergency, we're getting everybody on board working on this now, 
um, it is expected to be all done by December 2024. So by then, what we are going to be doing is actually making the fair plan provide insurance for 20 million per structure, not just per, uh, so then that way, you know, HOAs are going to be able to cover all of their structures. So that is the, the main, th that's the main thing that we're doing. Next, uh, next slide really quickly. That is the largest, uh, changes that we have done, uh, for, for the, um, for insurance, but that has not been done in a silo. I just want you all to know that we have been doing these kind of community meetings, talking to people with the commissioners since 2019. We have held more than 1,800 meetings. Now we're up to about 2,200. Uh, or so meetings, and we have met with hundreds of thousands of people throughout the state. It has not been done uh, by ourselves. It has been something that we have been working with all of you, and so we will continue to do that. And I will, um, we can just move on, uh, just because it's more, it's more information, you can keep going on that. Uh, and this has all to do with the Safer from Wildfires uh, framework, which was the regulation, that if you do all of these things to have your home safe from wildfires, you are, also, you are then supposed to get a, dis a discount. And that means that every insurance company has to do, has to pay attention to that for you. So if you have done these things, you will get a discount. Uh, so it's a safety from wildfires. It is, again, protecting your home, protecting your immediate surroundings. And then as a community, have you, any of you are a part of a fire safe council, fire, fire wise community? If you're not, make one. <laughs> and what that means is that you can go and you can work with your neighbors to make sure that all of you are doing the same thing and you're, you're being safe. And the more of these things that you do, the more discounts that you will be able to get with your insurance. So I will leave it at that so that... <laughs> Sorry. How about that? That was a performance. That, that was a lot of really good but complicated information. Um, thank you, Julia. I, I, I suspect that we might have some questions uh, about specific insurance uh, uh, concerns. Um, and uh, so now it, it's, it's time uh, for, for questions from the audience. I, 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 I want to uh, try to expect, we, we, we did have some questions that were submitted previously online. I suspect they may address some of the most common uh, concerns. And so if, if I may, I'd like to just take up two questions uh, before I open up to the audience. Number one is, are there any public funds to help cover damage caused to private homes from natural disasters like landslides? Julia, can you can you take that? There. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the Department of Insurance um, does have uh, does not do any grants itself. Uh, actually, the, the the legislature did put a lot of money into uh, getting ready for for disasters and all those types of things, and so all of those things are actually done through. Uh, the either Cal Fire or Cal OES, and so those are the um, the agencies that have that. And I know, and Jean, I believe that you talked about some of some, but I don't know. About yeah, the there, there's things. there isn't. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, this is working fine now. I think. Um, no, there isn't. There isn't one that I'm aware of um, for that one. We regularly um, refer people to um, the California program and to the federal program. Um, but they're limited and they really require that you have insurance first and if you can't get insurance on something that's otherwise uninsurable then it becomes not in the category of eligible mm -hmm. it is a very it's a it's a it's a rough yeah. it's a rough one it's the same I'm, I'm going to equate it to something so if you are in a flood zone and you don't have flood insurance it's a similar thing but you're not required to have it if you're not in a flood zone I don't know about you, but I know people who have been flooded who do not live in flood zones. And so it becomes a, just a loss that, that, that goes right there. And that's the only thing I can really, we haven't had too many of the land movement things yeah. to, to me to pull on. And, and land movement is, uh, is an uninsurable uh, thing in, in general. The only way that it would be covered through your homeowner's insurance is if it was uh, part of, let's say, a wildfire 
that happened, and then it's and then it, you know then there was sub, yeah, yeah so then it's something after that. But otherwise, um, it is not an, an insurable um, thing for most insurance companies. However, I would suggest that you talk to your broker and your agent and uh, or your agent and try to figure out you know what what is what do they have available? They might have something available that I that, that we're just not. Uh, aware of or, or how you know how they can work on that how um, that's just on on the insurance uh, part on how you can get insurance there as well okay thank you very much next question before I open up the uh, the audience is uh, what federal state and local funds are available to assist landslide victims who need to be evacuated um, yes I kind of want to go to Cheryl on this one just because the, the county does not have funds. We don't have funds for any kind of disaster for that. We use our local resources and we go up to this, the California Disaster Assistance Act um, for assistance and that's administered by the governor's office. Um, that is, we just pass right up to that level. So after that it becomes a state and a federal issue. And as, as I'm aware, I don't know if you when, when the local jurisdictions proclaim, they'll usually ask for state and federal assistance. And the state assistance piece is the California Disaster Assistance Act, which is at the discretion of the governor and the director of Cal OES. And um, that's a process where they determine whether or not there are funds available, the resources available at the local level, resources expended, and whether or not this is something that can be uh, remedied or if it's just, um, it's going to be an ongoing problem. It's, it's completely discretionary. Okay. All right. Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Hi. Thank you so much for all that information on the insurance stuff. Um, we have, um, I'm in Rolling Hills and in the block, Captain. Uh, organization. We have people who have already lost insurance, uh, specifically from travelers, and they are people who had been very proactive hardening their home. I'm with State Farm, and my insurance traveled to PV two years ago, but I spoke at length to my agent this week because I was looking into it for our block captains, and if I were to move now, they would not move insurance with me anywhere here in California. So not only are they taking a moratorium on new people, they're also not going to let their existing customers move right now. And so it doesn't really matter if you specifically have hardened your home or you haven't had any claims because they're losing money and they're taking a moratorium on that. And in terms of fire safe communities and fire councils, it's a lot of paperwork and I found out that it's a 2% discount on your insurance. For the fact that you'd have to get your whole neighborhood in on it, it's not that much of a discount and it's not going to help the people who have already lost their coverage. So I have a question that kind of involves the politicians and the fire department. We had the new um, law changed, AB um, 3074, which had some stricter regulations specifically for the zero to five, keeping it free and making, making it more difficult for fire to get right up to the houses. That was already passed, but the regulations haven't somehow been put into wording in a way that's enforceable. Or maybe fire department could explain that better, but in other words, the forestry <coughs> part of the fire department hasn't moved that down where the fire department could be currently enforcing that, even though it became a law. And I know the fire department is having way too much stuff on their plate because there's so many high fire hazard areas now. But it seems to be commonsensical, maybe, to go ahead and push that through so that stricter measures could be enforced so that there would be less risk of neighborhoods going up in flames, and that would help our insurance thing. Can someone speak to why the regulations aren't being enforced, and when is that going to happen? Okay. Um, Chief? Sure, I can touch a little bit on, and I'm, it's zone zero, which is that uh, zero to five. And um, we are local government that does the enforcement for CAL FIRE. And while that was passed, we are not sure why it wasn't implemented this year. And we don't, honestly, I don't see it happening for two to three years. What we're, what we're 
advocating is that uh, residents and uh, they follow the CAL FIRE website. There's a moderated zone zero um, um, website that talks about why there is a stall. And that's through the CAL FIRE website. But I can't tell you why it wasn't enforced this year. We thought it was going to be and it was pulled back at the very end. Which is why you got your information on that zero to five. And, and honestly it caused a, a lot of um, conflicting information. And you know we we've tried we've tried to just do an education piece, uh, but honestly, I don't see that being enforced for the next few years, just because of everything that's happening at the state level. California or politicians wouldn't be help wouldn't help push that along because obviously less fire risk means a better situation for insurance because Chief everybody. Bennett, I wasn't putting it on you guys at all. I know you're swamped okay. and doing a great job. That's okay. I'm just saying, why isn't everyone working together to make those, to make that a reality? So, um, and you can go into more detail, but on, on, uh, on the insurance portion of this, and I didn't go into detail on this, but what the, the Safer from Wildfire framework and the regulation there, what happened was we, every, agency throughout the state that worked on wildfire had a different set of rules that they all worked in. So uh, what we did is we brought everybody together, the commissioner got them all to then agree on very specific things that they would need to do um, so that, that a, a, a consumer uh, could do so that you could actually uh, see a, a difference. And so it was you know, five separate things for your home, you can, you know, there's a checklist. For your surroundings, there's a checklist. And then for your community uh, as a whole, the idea behind it was very much so, if the entire area is safer, then we can, then the insurance, uh, as you know, will, will come down, right? But on, you know, that is regulation, that is the law right now for insurance companies. So Commissioner Lara did do that. In insurance companies saw that that was happening, and so they already started putting together um, those discounts. I understand that for some folks it has been one, two percent. It hasn't been very much, or you know. Uh, but I got to tell you, last week I was in Napa doing this type of thing too, and somebody got up, and this uh, this couple. Uh, said I have been I did all, all everything that I needed to do and I got the fire marshal to come and look at my property I got the insurance company to come and look at it, and then I got a thousand dollar discount I that's substantial, you know, and so I'm I, so I know that it's not happening fast enough And like I said earlier government doesn't move very fast. However, it is, you know, it is happening. It's just, it's going to take some time, but it is, it's, it, you know, it's moving in that direction. And if you, you as a community can work together and, you know, if this is already in place and you are, you know, and, and you can all work together uh, to make sure that, you know, if your home is safe, but if the neighbor down the street, most of the time what we have found is that it's probably somebody who is retired, who can't really take care of, uh, take care of the big things and then a community comes together and they all work together to help that person out and then everybody then is safer and because of that that's where they can see and the more that you do the more discounts that you get so right now the insurance companies are saying they will go up to 20 30 percent if they can see that all of these things are happening in those in those areas so yeah, I, I know that you probably have follow-up questions, but if you can approach the uh, panelists individually, um, we would appreciate it. Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, I think just the, the amount of the task of going from above ground to underground is, um, is quite the task. We do know that uh, there have been wildfires started 
from down power lines and Edison is doing what they can do what they can for uh, the roving blackouts that you'll see and, and de-energizing during high fire times. Uh, but as far as a, a city or a community doing it, that's uh, that's more than I can answer to. If I can throw in, there are communities where Edison is doing that, very limited. But the other thing that they're doing is they're shielding. They're doing a lot of shielding on their on their on their wires, especially in high fire zones. I would encourage you to to reach out to Edison on this one. They actually have a really robust program where they are they have identified where they're shielding. They, they really the undergrounding is really a lot more complex and a lot more expensive, but the shielding is just as effective, and I think that's something that you can look into with them. Um, and, and we can add more. I, I also w want to <laughs> volunteer Senator Allen. I, I know that uh, you know th there have been legislation passed in, in, in recent years to uh, require utilities to uh, harden, uh, uh, to, to fix their, their uh, high voltage power lines. Um, you know, a lot of that has taken place in Northern California, where uh, I, I hear a lot of my Northern California friends talking about how their their uh, rates are, are are skyrocketing in PG&E country because PG&E is uh, is doing a lot of or some of that undergrounding, but but you know that is being passed on to ratepayers, and so that's that's my understanding of what, what's happening. Perhaps you can follow up with Senator Allen afterwards. Uh, or, or, or you want to jump? You want to jump in? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, man. Yeah, regarding blackouts, there is a utility in Vermont that has just started. I think they submitted a proposal for this. Instead of building out power, trans power generation, transmission lines, which are all really vulnerable to climate change, what they're doing is they're purchasing for every customer battery storage. So this is like radically different. It's an unutility solution because it's not the way a utility traditionally makes money, right? And so they, these customers will never experience another black. And I'm not associated with them. I'm not associated with the battery storage company industry. But these com these Customers will never experience another black unless something happens to their battery storage. And so I think it's really important to think outside of the box of what we've been doing traditionally, right? Because when you have distributed energy resources, you have more resiliency, you have more redundancy, you have a smaller footprint that when it gets, I mean, you take out a substation, you take out some power lines, you lose power to tens of thousands of people. And so we really need to think outside of this box of what we've been doing traditionally. And the utility tax is not a good idea. And the way that, and I'm speaking to our legislators, you've been disincentivizing solar in this state, and please stop doing that. Because solar plus battery storage will be key to disaster preparedness. And do you also know that um, EV batteries are being reused for batteries? You know this, right? So there's a whole DIY movement among people who are connecting up their used EV batteries solar array. I mean, there's a world of innovation out there. You, we just need the regulatory hurdles, legislative hurdles to be move, moved out of the way. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, I think actually with Alan, me, you've got two people who are really in agreement with you on this. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the big utilities and some of their uh, partners have been pushing back really hard. And they have this whole narrative about how there's a, an unfair, an unfair uh, subsidy and, and they keep pushing but I think from our perspective given all the challenges of climate uh, uh, you know both both globally but also locally because there's a resiliency component to this that you correctly point out uh, we really shouldn't be doing anything to disincentivize uh, the use of greater solar including on, on, on rooftops and so um, I'm, I'm I'm not in, I'm not happy about what's been happening at the PUC and we've been writing letters and engaging and trying to push back with some success but not not as much as I would like mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just add to Senator Allen that uh, the, 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 one of the big challenges now is, you know, the, 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 the focus on equity, that, that uh, you know, it tends to be higher income uh, households that can afford solar and battery storage. Uh, what about the, the vast majority of Californians that, that have not been able to afford solar and storage? And so I, I agree with you that we need to have more 
solar and, and battery storage, you know, re relying less on these high power transmission lines, uh, especially in wildfire, uh, high risk wildfire zones. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's a big state, it's, it's, it's a complicated situation. Happy to follow up. Uh, uh, Because utilities will pass those costs, costs on to ratepayers. Yeah. yeah. We will happy to happy to happy to follow up. Yes, ma'am. I'm Katia Gomez, president of the Academy Hill Homes Association, and um, we first of all thank you everyone who put this together bringing the government to us here in the on the panel and, and behind the scenes i know it takes a lot of legwork so we really appreciate it we as an association are also concerned about emergency preparedness and one of the things that we did do that actually happened this week is meet with we are in an unincorporated area of the peninsula near chadwick school uh, and uh, we did meet with representatives from fire uh, the sheriff's department and chadwick and our association this week and one of the things that came out of it is that our community of residents do not have an evacuation plan. And we would like to move forward in coming up with an evacuation plan for our residents. I know Chadwick School has one for their students. Um, we would love to ask for help from either, from you, uh, Assemblyman, uh, or, or the Senator, to um, help us find resources to find we were told to find an evacuation consultant that could help us come because I, we don't know a lot about this so and, and we are also as an aside uh starting a group of uh getting a group of residents together to be part of a hybrid cert program because we also want to be part of the solution so um chief would you be able to address yes and uh, i i wasn't at the meeting that you guys had last week, um, but I do hear that there was it was productive. And again, we are here as your fire department that can help you in any way with an evacuation, whether it's evacuation plan, shelter in place, whatever whatever the school in that HOA needs. Right. Actually, help us come up with an evacuation plan. We were told that we need that first before we can move forward with other ideas that we have. For example, uh, having a drill for the entire community. We were told we needed a consultant to help us to come up with an evacuation plan. Does, does anybody have any ideas to help us with where to find one? And to fund it, yeah, and to help us fund it. I, I, I guess part of the question is, yeah. th does PVP Ready cover the unincorporated parts of the peninsula? Is that, is that what you're asking? Because that's yeah. what PVP Ready is about, right? Evacuation right. plans. Yeah, and, and we can give you the template. We could give you a template because there's other cities, like Malibu, they've all had uh, those evacuation drills. So we should be able to give you a template. Um, we can have a sidebar. I haven't heard anything about a consultant, uh, but you know, we're your local fire department. We can help you. But, but, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm not understanding. I, I don't have a consultant that we work uh -huh. with. We just we will do an evacuation and help you with an evacuation plan. Yeah. Sure. So. Yeah. And we can handle. So, 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 Chief, I mean, Senator Allen is, is highlighting that we need to get Supervisor Hahn involved in, in this. But am, am I correct or not? Uh, does PVP ready? Does that include the unincorporated, or, or, or yeah, do we need? Yeah, I, I believe I believe it does. We do have uh, is Jessica. Hi, um, so I'm a staff member of the City of Rolling Hills Estates, um, and yes, the Know Your Zone PVP Ready does apply to the unincorporated area. So when we speak about evacuation planning um, and things like that, Know Your Zone is evacuation planning. Um, so it does apply to the entire Palos Verdes Peninsula with very, very specific planning. Um, it, Cities and, and um, unincorporated areas, they may want to do their own very specific planning, but the no year zone does apply to to everyone. So I just wanted to, to mention that. Mm -hmm. So 
So evacuation drill is a lot different. Um, it's very coordinated, it'd be a lot smaller probably. You will want to work with you know, your HOA and law and public, you know, public safety partners. Um, but I think you're speaking about maybe putting something on paper um, is a bit different, right? Because, and I don't want to speak for you, Chief, but... Yeah, this no might be, and I'm here tonight, this afternoon, I may be better for a sidebar, so I understand everything that the school and, and the community wants. Yeah. So I, Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so we'll follow up on that. Yes, sir. And then, sir. I live on the other side of the hill over by PBEs through the switchbacks in 83's territory. We got weeds that are six to eight feet high. What happened to the goats? <laughs> Where are our goats? I think we got a legislator that made the uh, something to do that they had to pay the shepherd 24-hour fee, so now the guy isn't going to do it. I mean, these goats are very important to you and to us. Is that a, uh, a city measure in terms of, yeah. Uh, we use the goats every year, and sometimes um, throughout the year, uh, we, we've gone, we've sent the goats to the same location three times because we'll treat the area with the goats and then it'll rain, we'll, we'll, we'll get some more vegetation, we'll have to go back in there and treat them, but we do it um, throughout the city in Rancho Palos Verdes. We do, we have them there. They were there, it just, one of the things, that the, the switchbacks, that's part of the city's nature preserve, so the limit, there's limitations as to how much um, removal can occur. No, that's, it, that's in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, and you're not going to see the city either. So um, we're, we're working, we work very closely with the fire department as well as the wildlife agencies in making sure that we adhere to all the required brush clearance. And the goats, we use them throughout the city. I'll, I'll look into that for you. Okay. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, not just pertain to the Palsburn and Rolling Hills, but recently we had a mini tornadoes in Carson, Compton, seat of industry, and the sea level rising is causing a high alert for me and my family living here, knowing the fact if we have a tsunami or a tornado hitting the chemical treatment plants surrounding the Palsburn, it may cause a havoc of pollution. We're going to be stranded. Is there a plan ahead? Are we going to, is it California, are we building some kind of seawalls or some kind of plans to prevent widespread of the chemicals? Because we're surrounded by oil refining chemical plants and reclaimed, you know, water treatment centers. You're, you're, you're talking about the overall concern about sea level rise and how it's not just a concern. Yeah, so. I, I will say that, that tsunamis in Los Angeles County are going to hit south-facing beaches. We actually don't have as much exposure as some other area, and the elevation here makes it a little bit different. I would suggest that um, there, the maps, the inundation maps for tsunamis are online. Cal OES maintains those, um, and uh, that, that's the place to start. I can assure you that we have looked, our, our colleagues mostly, I don't think, neither Cheryl and I have been involved in that particular planning, um, but those are taken into account. And I think if you look at the state tsunami plan with the inundation zones, I think we can start to get to that answer. Um, we don't know it, I'm pretty sure. No. And we do have a seismic hazards um, division. So if you check on our website, they do have some research in there about the rising sea level and seawalls and um, tsunami hazards from from an, uh, an offshore earthquake or a siege that may cause um, a, a tsunami from a different direction. Right, and, and, and for Rancho pa sir, for Rancho Palos Verdes, we actually have 7.1 miles of coastline, and it's and we study sea level rise. It's part of our climate action plan. It's it's embedded in our general plan and other documents. So so that is something that uh, Rancho Palos Verdes takes into account. 
If All I'm right. Gonna, if, sorry, just very quickly also, just so you know, um, the Department of Insurance, when Commissioner Lara came on board in 2019, he created the Office of Climate, uh, Climate Insurance and Sustainability. And so it is the, the first in the nation, and what we are doing is actually studying all of that, uh, particularly uh, working with all of the, the universities in the state and also working with the United Nations on putting a plan together for California as a whole as it pertains to sea level rise and all of that along with uh, what insurance, what we can do f for that. There have been some amazing things that have happened around the world that people are actually for instance, in the um, in uh, in Cancun, uh, what they did is they actually insured the um, the coral reefs, and so that basically all of the all of the um, the hotels in the in the area right there, they got it. They got a, a an insurance policy, and so when there is a storm and the coral reef breaks, and there is some you know th there's a lot of loss there, that immediately triggers then work to be done within that, and then that is, is taken care of by insurance. So those are things that we're looking at to try to figure out how do we do that for California in some way, looking at all of the different things that we have available that nature is actually you know, set up to, to help with that. So th those are things that we're looking into as well. Okay, I, I, I want to move but on gonna, to give everyone can, a chance. I can check in with you afterwards. Yes, uh, please follow up with the individual panelists if you want to follow up. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, think, I think this is a question for the insurance commissioner. Um, we're, we are in the process or have already installed cameras and AI to detect fires on the peninsula. Is there a way we can parlay that into lower insurance rates? As we think it's going to make us much more safe, we really love having the system, we would think the insurance companies would see the same value and therefore give us breaks. Yeah. It should be part of, uh, part of that and that's where the whole community uh, portion uh, comes together. So if you all receive, for instance, uh, what I would suggest, and you know, working with your cities, maybe if your city can send you a letter saying, hey, these are all the things that we are doing to protect you from wildfires. Then when you go talk to your insurance company, you can say, here are the things I have done in my home. These are the things that I'm doing in my immediate surroundings. And this is what my city has been doing. Then what is my what can I get as, as a discount? And the, those things should be taken into consideration. Uh, I see. So is, is, are you aware of any city that has or any homeowner that's been able to uh, make an argument that cameras with AIs, AI well, in the area? Well, those are part of, that is part of um, some of the, the things that, that you get grants for, like cities and communities have been able to get grants from, uh, from the right, state right, I, I for that kind of thing, so they should be taken care of. But it's not, not, not yeah, they don't, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not saying that they don't. really asking about, about the insurance they, rates, not about the installation of yeah, the cameras. Yeah, no, no, I'm just saying, but because of that has been part of, uh, part of that, then it should be taken into consideration. I, but every community has got to be, it's, it's different, and you have to, and every insurance company is taking different things separately, so you have to, you have to ask your insurance company directly. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, assembly member, for arranging this forum today, and to the speakers, I appreciate it. Uh, back to that issue of home property insurance. Over the past two and a half years, all the stakeholders and a number of very involved citizens have been involved in crafting this regulation with the uh, commissioner. Uh, now, now that the law is in place, it's enforced, there are still a number of insurers, the company's not offering the discounts for home mitigation. So what the prior uh, questioner just asked about is the city mitigation. Uh, I guess our city could do a little better in putting our community mitigation steps on one document. Right now, uh, the homeowner has to collect, you know, a little bit about the about the goal, uh, the goats, a little bit about the wildfires, but maybe put it in one document. But the the insurers are still a number of them not offering mitigation discounts. So if you could confirm they are, they should be or not be, and also to confirm that everyone is using the same playbook, so the same number of steps for the home mitigation, so it's the same checklist between insurer A and insurer B. Thank you. Thank you. So the Safer from Wildfires framework, you can find it in our website, and our website is insurance.ca.gov. Um, and that is very specific things 
every, that for, every, for everything. Um, it, it is the law of the land right now for insurance companies that they have to take this into consideration when they're doing, when they're reviewing your, um, your property. The problem is that every insurance company is different and they will give you different things for each one. And so when you are about to renew your policy is when you can go and you talk to your insurance and, and, and ask. Um, if, and most of them already have it, um, have that in, in place. If they don't, what you can do is you can call the department. We have experts in our office there from uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day. It's an 800 number, and we are absolutely available to talk to you through it. We can work, look at your policy with you, and then we can contact the insurance company and see what we can do. One thing that I didn't mention is if you are told that because you have a wildfire risk score that your, your, you know, and your wildfire risk score is so high, um, that they can't give you insurance because of that, um, or that they will give you a higher premium. Uh, what you can do now, in the past, insurance companies would say, you would ask them, well, how did you come to that number? What is my number? They would say, that's proprietary information. We can't share that with you. Now they have to. It's part of the, the regulations that the commissioner did. So you are able to ask them, how did they come up with that number? What is my number? How did you come up with it? I don't agree with it, so you can appeal it. And if you don't get anywhere with the insurance company, again, you can contact us and we can work with you through it and, and work with, a, with, a, with the insurance company. Okay, we are running out of time. Two, two more questions, sir and ma'am. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, red flag days, has there been any uh, consideration given that when certain areas of, for example, the peninsula have been declared to be a red flag uh, situation that the uh, traffic be, let's say, limited into those areas, either into those areas and around inside those areas. For example, let's say, for example, Rolling Hills has been declared a red flag day, it covers that area. Can, has there been any consideration given to reduce the amount of traffic into, say, the city of Rolling Hills? Or, for example, if it covers the uh, nature preserve, has there been any consideration given in reducing the amount of foot traffic into the nature preserve when on a red flag day? And, and it's really quite simple. The trails, both in Rolling Hills and in the nature preserve, when we have adverse weather conditions, such as a lot of rain, they'll shut them down. And now we see that in uh, the the nature preserve, they've shut down certain trails because of the land movement. A red flag day is no different. So that should be really pushed and coordinated throughout the peninsula, in my humble opinion. Thank you. I'll just add a comment to that, and I, I think that's very valid. And now our fire prediction and our fire weather is so good that we could um, work with the cities and make sure that they're notified of uh, those red flag days and we've had a uh, preliminary discussions about that because traffic just inherently on a afternoon on PV Drive is already busy so I, th I think that's all fantastic points and the, and we would support that support each of the four cities and and help them through uh, some of those plans right. and, and I'd like to add for the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve in Rancho Palos Verdes, we have 1,500 acres of open space, and we do we have considered closing uh, the preserve uh, on red flag days. We'll, we coordinate with the the chief and the fire uh, department to determine whether the risk is there for us to close it. And one comment I just want to add, um, just a comment for the assembly member. While this whole uh, town hall was occurring, I got a I got a notification from Pano AI. There was a there was a smoke detection, uh, but it was the camera facing from Palos Verdes States, and it was in uh, Torrance. It was uh, a house fire. But if anybody's curious, I can show you the image and the, the notification I get on my phone. Okay. All right, but the system is working then. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I, I know that there are other people uh, that have questions. If you can approach the panelists uh, or myself individually, um, I know I, I'll be sticking around. Um, but we do need to uh, 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 wind up the program. Last question, ma'am. 
Thank you, Assemblyman, and thank you for everyone for being here for stuff like this. Much appreciated. Um, my name is Tasha Hinchlip. I'm a resident over at the Portuguese Bend Beach Club, and I would like to know where have addressed a lot of very scary situations with the wildfires. However, we have an ongoing, everyday problem in Rancho Palos Verdes, in Seaview, in the um, preserve area, at PBC, and in the Ladera Linda community. And I don't doubt that we don't have the same problem in many other communities on the peninsula, which is that Cal Waters infrastructure is broken. And I would like to know if anyone could please address, it was brought up during our city council meeting, and I very much appreciate all the work that you're doing, sir, at the city. Um, can someone please address what Cal Water is doing proactively to figure out where the leaks were, are um, along that, someone's got to have a map of our infrastructure. We had another leak this morning at a site in PBC that they've repaired supposedly three times. I walk my dog and I find leaks happening and have to call the emergency line at night. So can someone please tell me what is happening proactively? Because that is going on every day. And as you heard, we can't get insurance for in a landslide area or for land movement. Okay, uh, Angie, yeah, okay. Hi, Angie Gilbert with Calwater. So we recently co um, completed a topographic survey of, I mean, as you guys know, we're, we've been working with the Seaview neighborhood, P Portuguese Bend Beach Club, um, the PBCA, also working very closely with the city through their working group, right, that they've established. Um, there's a number of things, short-term and long-term, that we, we've implemented um, as early as at the, the beginning of this year. Um, in terms of monitoring, um, we've, we've installed um, leak detection sensors throughout the various neighborhoods. We also have water pressure monitors, which work in near real time to detect drops in water pressure. Um, we also have technicians on the ground walking our alignment, and this is happening. Um, I, I see you shaking your head, but but we do. Um, every we do daily. Um, we also have um, our our employees walking the Burma Trail as well, because we know that the preserve area was a point of concern. Um, but in terms of the infrastructure improvement um, forecasting, the, the topographic survey will help our engineers identify um, hotspots, right? Because there has been a lot of land movement since, you know, who knows what, what data we have. So that, that has been completed, and then they will look to see what areas to, to um, replace Python. As an example, we um, recently just submitted a project for the Seaview neighborhood on Dauntless and Exultin. That's, you guys are aware, it, it, they've seen a lot of movement there, where we are replacing the, the main there um, and, and moving the main above ground with flexible couplings. So we're looking at everything. I mean, we're taking this very seriously. We know how important this topic is to you. It's important to us, too. Our infrastructure has been affected by land movement. So we've been at the table. We've, we've offered to speak you know, to different resident associations, HOAs, and we want you to bring those concerns directly to us because, um, as you said, you're hearing things at city council, but, you know, just know that we're here. You, please reach out to us if you have any questions, and, and we're committed to working with our partners. Oh, that yes, that's right. We also established a hotline, a dedicated hotline for RPV um, customers um, that would go directly to uh, a certain group of people. Actually, the, that number is... 855-RPV-LEAK, that's 778-5325. So in addition to the 310-257-1400 number that um, our customers have, um, can reach our customer service um, hotline to, we've established a dedicated hotline in, in lieu of everything that's been going on. All right, I, I know that there are a lot more questions, and so uh, uh, if, if you can grab myself or any, any one of the panelists, uh, um, um, uh, please try to do so. But I uh, want to thank everyone for coming out. We hope that we were able to answer most of your questions. Let's give a, a special round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much for taking time out of the, their Sunday afternoon to, to be with us. Thank you very much for sharing all your, your, uh, your expertise and, and your background. Uh, 
uh, in, in these areas. I uh, want to also give special thanks to Rolling Hills Estates. They, they really worked hard with us to, uh, to make this event happen. Thank you very much. I, I know that Supervisor Janice Hahn's uh, representative left, but uh, they worked hard to make sure that we have our LA County representatives. I want to thank also our, our state um, uh, Cal OEM and California Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara uh, and, uh, and, and Julia for being here. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, uh, my staff worked real hard to pull this all together. District Director <laughs> Melissa Ramoso, Cody Bridges, Senior Field Representative uh, Brian Singh, and Amy Arzate came down from Sacramento. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>